Hi, everybody. As Jessica said, I'm Madhavrajan. I'm the uh, Dean and the George Schultz Professor of Accounting at uh, Chicago Booth. Uh, a small shout out, George Schultz, who was formerly a Dean at Chicago Booth, turns 100 in five days. Happy birthday, George. Um, I hope all of you are doing well and staying safe. It's, uh, as Jessica said, we're grateful that you took the time to be with us today. Uh, we have a truly amazing event with uh, Booth alum, uh, Dr. Pat Basu, uh, whom I'll introduce in just a bit. Um, so this is our Distinguished Speaker Series, uh, the virtual version of that. The Speaker Series is a longstanding tradition at Chicago Booth. Uh, we bring in high-profile leaders from, the, from business, from the government, from the community to share their insights and experience with all of you. Uh, we had our first virtual DSS event uh, way back in the spring, uh, and it turned out to be very successful. We had great chats with uh, alumni such as Kurt Del Bene from Microsoft, uh, Tom Ricketts of the Cubs, Jenny Scanlon from UL, uh, Byron Trott of BDT, and learned a lot about how these executives and their companies responded to COVID-19. We resumed the series this fall, and we've had a bunch of conversations with people like Ann Mukherjee, the chairman and CEO of Erno Ricard North America, uh, JP Gan of Inns Capital in Shanghai, uh, Dave McLennan, the CEO of Cargill, and most recently, Dr. Griffin Myers of Oak Street Health. Uh, with that, I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker, uh, a former Stanford physician and White House advisor, uh, Dr. Pat Boss, who is president and CEO of Cancer Treatment Centers of America Global, which includes a network of hospitals and outpatient care centers, as well as new business ventures designed to expand access to the network's high-quality oncology care. Uh, Pat also co-founded Doctor on Demand and led several businesses for Optum United Health, where he was senior vice president and a member of the executive leadership team of United Health Group, which is the largest healthcare firm in the, in the US. Uh, Pat earned his BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois, and later received both his medical degree from U Chicago while earning his MBA from Chicago Booth. Uh, Pat, it's uh, great to have you with us on this, on this event today. Thanks, Madhav. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, happy 100th to uh, uh, Secretary Schultz. I've, I've had the privilege of uh, interacting with him in, in multiple capacities and uh, great to see, see you. Thank you for uh, your leadership, for um, you know, my, my proud alma mater. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Pat. So uh, maybe we'll start with your career. You've had a very uh, varied career, lots of high profile positions in very, very different sort of spheres, right? As a practicing doctor, uh, then in private equity, uh, as CEO multiple times, and then stints at the White House. Can you talk us through just your career progression? How much of it was planned out? How did things sort of evolve to where they're? Yeah, ha happy to do so. And, uh, you know, it's always, uh, I think as, as uh, Steve, to paraphrase, uh, I believe Steve Jobs one time at a, at a Stanford commencement, he sort of made this this phrase that it's, it's always easier to draw the points retrospectively uh, looking backwards and make it sound much more clean and articulate than uh, than it's planned. Uh, that being said, happy to to kind of walk you through. I, I will say that um, I sometimes joke that there's a, a little bit of element. It seems like a little bit of multi-personality disorder when you look at uh, engineering to medicine, to business, to policy, you know, back to business. But, but a few common themes. Uh, you mentioned studying engineering uh, as an undergrad. A couple of things that stuck with me there were, uh, number one, Kaizen, just a constant attitude towards optimizing something. You know, as an engineer, it was make the, make the jet faster, make the car safer, make the bridge stronger. But in, in other aspects of my career, it's been, you know, how do you design a, a safer healthcare system or how do you design a, uh, you know, a, a better, uh, you know, operational pathway? Uh, just to, you know, cut to some of the chase, uh, obviously so many elements of Booth were, were integral in, in developing these skill sets. But the, the second thing from an engineering perspective was, was a systematic approach. Uh, you know, whether it's anything from government to sports teams to, to running businesses, you could have great people in a bad system and your outcomes are, are not, not good, or you can have maybe human error within a good system and, and that system produces, uh, you know, better results. So carried that with me uh, into in the medicine 
And I think medicine is, is one of those areas that, you know, we've certainly seen in, in this interesting year of 2020 where healthcare affects everybody in every single way. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the mission aspect is always fulfilling. The science is always interesting. But I think where the, the story for me takes its, its inflection point is as an engineer working as, a, uh, as somebody, you know, at the time, not even a full doctor, as a medical student, I immediately saw that the system was broken and the aspects of fixing the system were really based on some of the things that, a, that an MBA, let alone from, you know, the, the best, you know, the best business school in the world would help uh, fix. So namely, it wasn't that there was a lack of capital. You know, the U.S. invests three and a half trillion dollars, you know, 19% of GDP. There was plenty of capital. It wasn't even a human capital issue. You know, physicians are are uh, known to be pretty, pretty, you know, intelligent people. But how do you allocate the capital? How do you finance? How do you administer? How do you operationalize? Uh, how do you strategize uh, all of those assets into a into a way that makes a better healthcare system? Lowercase h and, and uppercase h, meaning I saw medical errors left and right in the, you know, in the early 2000s. And it, it wasn't a shocker when I would scribble in my poor handwriting a drug dose, send it into a tube, and the wrong dosage would come back. Uh, and, and so really the MBA began as something, Madhav, that was a way to build a better American healthcare system, a mission that, that still stays with me. But honestly, it, it actually morphed into so many other opportunities. And there's a quote that I love by Sun Tzu, opportunities multiply as they are seized. And what much of my life and certainly my time at, at Booth showed me was that if you, uh, you know, have a strategy and you put your nose to the grindstone and you, you walk through those opportunities, then, then many more open up to you. And I'll give you an example. I, I was... Uh, I like to joke that prior to Booth, I thought the SEC stood for the, the second best football conference in the country after the Big Ten, the Southeastern Conference, let alone, uh, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission. But, but jokes aside, I, I really wasn't familiar with private equity and venture capital, but was steeped in a, in a lot of those classes and experiences at Booth. Uh, certainly, I can trace so many of my professional aspects into either the classroom or outside the classroom at Booth. And then the final thing I would add, particularly maybe for the students, but also for any alums out there, is I remember giving a, I guess the message would be this, have the courage to take the path less traveled. Have the courage to maybe zig when other people are saying to zag. I can tell you every point in my career, when I was an engineer, people said, why are you going into medicine? When I was you know, full-time doctor at Stanford, people said, why are you going to work at the White House? Uh, and, and you have to have the courage, just like any executive or any entrepreneur, to take that advice, but also to chart your own course. And I was sitting in an audience in Washington, and, and the topic of the panel was basically how to, how to get a job at the White House. And I asked people to raise their hand, how many were lawyers, how many were assistant chiefs of staff or chiefs of staff, and a lot of hands went up. And my point was that, you know, you don't want to be a needle in a stack of needles, that when you have an interdisciplinary career, when you have breadth, it it really gives you a, a set of skills and experiences that allowed you to, to add real value. And every one of my career experiences has built upon the previous one has added to the, to the next one. So um, you, you mentioned some of the other things uh, from, from starting a company to leading a large company, all of those sort of intertwine with the themes of building a better healthcare system, uh, being mission driven as it, as it relates to people and, and frankly, just continuing to be a lifelong learner and contributor. Mm -hmm. So you spoke about standing out and, and certainly doing an MD, MBA makes you a, a very unique sort of person. Did you know going in that those were areas of interest to you and eventually you wanted to sort of be at the intersection of those things? I mean, how did you think through that decision? <clears throat> yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a somewhat interesting story. I, I like to pretend I'm more exciting and spontaneous than perhaps I really am. There was a, uh, <laughs> there was an article that somebody sent me from high school or college and, and it was kind of embarrassing, I guess, that, uh, it actually said that, uh, you know, down the road, I'd like to <laughs> lead change in, in healthcare, kind of at the intersection of, 
of uh, you know building a better healthcare system and, and managing healthcare. So as as I guess I'm not as wild and spontaneous as I as I would hope that I am, but uh, uh, I, I will say this: I, I think I've always had a deep interest, passion, and respect for business and finance and understanding of the market from a earlier time and how that can be applicable to any sector. So I think the rough nodes of it were there, but I never ever would have dreamed uh, the practical, uh, you know, pragmatic impact that my my Booth MBA would actually give me again, let alone opening up the opportunities and even the horizons. But but, but I think I, I had an inclination and a proclivity towards that intersection, yes, of, of medicine and business, maybe for some time. Uh, but w- what happened afterwards is, is, is something I think I'm just very, very grateful for and, and would not have been able to predict. So you joined your current organization, the Cancer Treatment Centers, as president and CEO, uh, I guess, March of last year. What attracted you to this opportunity and what sort of makes them stand out in your mind? Yeah, you know, without a doubt, I I always um, in my organization I lead with you know I say we always have to start with mission and then vision and then strategy and then operations and so applied to to oneself um, you know there there's a saying uh, you know someone someone with a why can accomplish almost any how right and um, and and for me it was the why the, you know cancer with one of the fighting cancer, literally when, when I first even became a physician, it was one of those things that drew me to the practice of medicine in the first place. It is a, uh, a horrific disease that attacks the body, the mind and the spirit uh, that, that sadly uh, takes the lives of 10 million human beings every single year. It is the definition of a intergenerational, international, uh, you know, I don't use this word lightly, uh, epidemic that, that has been, you know, a plague on humanity for a long time. So w- when the call came about this, th- the first thing was was one of mission and, and why. And so that aspect, I, I think, as I, as I look back and also as I just, you know, to any, anybody in the audience from a motivation perspective, you're going to work very, very hard as a professional, irrespective of what you do after graduation. So you really, really want it to be worth it. You want those flights away from your family. You want those long hours, those tough times, those ups and downs to really always be about a mission that that is worth it. And and so for me, that was the piece. Secondarily, I I found, uh, you know, an organization inside of a sector, meaning CTCA inside of a healthcare sector that was really going through a lot of change and a lot of dynamism. I sometimes call it healthcare 1.0 and healthcare 2.0. Healthcare 1.0, a very in the box, deliver care within the four walls, fee for service, traditional as it's been done for 70 years. Healthcare 2.0 is one where a lot more technology is involved, a lot of new financing mechanisms like value-based care, applying big data and artificial intelligence, all the things that, you know, that telehealth and virtual care. This was an organization inside of a sector that I felt that as somebody who knew and was steeped in healthcare 1.0, but had really done a lot in healthcare 2.0, it was the right calling. We talk a lot about product market fit. I sometimes talk a lot about company executive fit and it's about culture. It's about the timing. You may not be the perfect leader all the time, but at a certain point, uh, you know, you hope that you're the right leader for that right time. And, and that's what I felt for uh, the CTC opportunity. This is a, a time to change the face of cancer, change the face of healthcare, And this is an organization that, that um, I think I could add great value to doing those things with. So you, you use the word epidemic. So I'll ask you about the, the current pandemic that we're going through. Um, many healthcare businesses haven't done as well during this time, they've sort of struggled. How has it been for you? How is CTCA sort of coming through this? You know, it's, it's been it's been challenging. It's it's been a uh, you know again, leaders I think have to have the right balance between humility and confidence, and uh, and and it's always always at that intersection that balance. 
And um, it, it's been tough. I have a, a friend that I worked with at the White House who is a, um, a, a Navy SEAL uh, commander, a, a captain, and he's very understated. And he always has this euphemism. Uh, he calls it a tough operating environment even though they may have had to jump out of a plane at 20,000 feet in the, you know, under cover of darkness and uh, land on a mountaintop, it's a tough operating environment. So I joke with my team, this has been a tough operating environment <laughs> using that same euphemism. Look, look, we're taking care of some of the most vulnerable uh, patients with a complex disease in an immunocompromised state in an environment of a massive pandemic where there are disruptions in supply chain, there are the needs to get PPE, there are security protocols. And so as a leader, just as a doctor, you have to have a, a comfort with wanting to lead and have the ball in your hands. And you also, you have a chance to make the greatest impact during these times. And so it's been tough, Madhav, but I think we've done a remarkable job and the credit belongs to my team. They have been so resilient, so focused and so mission driven that by almost any metric, uh, we have done better than industry peer groups, meaning within oncology, within healthcare, we've had less of an impact on volume. Uh, our quality and our satisfaction has, has, has really, in, in fact, uh, even improved. And we've had to be very nimble and innovative. It, it's been hard. I mean, I remember being on the phone at two o'clock in the morning trying to secure, you know, 5,000 masks and 20,000 gloves, uh, you know, during a very chaotic time with very little national coordination. Um, you know, it, it's been challenging for sure, but uh, it's been rewarding. And as I told the team very recently, when I told the story of, of a patient who, literally is, is alive now because of care this year. Um, every one of the thousands and tens of thousands of patients that we, we've been able to take care of in between this hurricane and this firestorm and this asteroid field, it's because of the, the clarity of, of, of the team and, the, and just the perseverance. So um, it's been challenging. I, I can't sugarcoat it, but it's been very rewarding. So going back in 2010, you spent, uh, President Obama appointed you a White House fellow. You were one of 13 fellows who spent a year uh, advising federal officials. That experience, what was that like? And from what you learned or studied in Washington, how has that informed your perspective on the current crisis? You know, in a, in a phrase, it was uh, absolutely life-changing and, and game-changing, um, you know, to to maybe put in a, a, a brief uh, plug to any uh, you know Booth alums, uh, the White House Fellowship uh, is something worth looking into. An incredible opportunity to to serve your country at a at a point later in life and a point later in your in your career where you can really make a difference and really uh, impact things, but also at the same time learn a lot. And uh, you know, Madhav, to your to your question. I learned so many things in, in so many dimensions. I, I told you, I believe in being a, a lifelong learner and sometimes in this environment and the, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the Twitter environment where, you know, we're not as, we're not as humble, we're not as lifelong learning, but, but there's always so much to learn, you know, from anybody and from any experience. But for, first and foremost, you constantly grow as a person. You, you, you learn, you know, you develop a maturity and perspective. Um, I learned on the job, but I absolutely learned about, you know, again, what I said about healthcare, you can almost say about interacting with the government. It's, it touches almost everything. And, and irrespective of one's, uh, you know, economic policy or fiscal policy or monetary policy views, uh, Understanding how the U.S. government works and shaping policy is a is a skill set that is both valuable um, and 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 certainly interesting. So, so I, I learned a lot in that dimension. Um, I'll give you some examples. I learned a ton about the difference between politics and policy. Um, you know, I, I recall being in um, in a couple of rooms with, uh, you know, senior members of the executive branch, senior members of the legislative branch. And it took us less than an hour to come up with the policy right solutions, 
right? From an economic perspective, from a budget perspective, from a healthcare perspective, a lot of agreement that this is the right answer. It took five hours to discuss the politics being that, well, I, I made this promise, I can't go against it. Or um, I made this deal or so-and-so is, is gonna be you know mad about this. And, and instead of being disheartened by it, I, you know, like so many things in life, you, you come up against an obstacle, you are maybe initially frustrated, but you just learn that you have to try and find a way to overcome that. And I, and I see that now. I see that so many things in our um, current zeitgeist, our current environment is not about a disagreement in the answer. It's not about a disagreement in the policy. It's much more the politics. It's much more the messaging. Uh, I'll give you some, some examples. If, if you look at the elements of the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, most of the individual principles rate somewhere between a 75 and a 95% approval rating. But you package it under a certain name or even under a certain branding uh, and you find polarizing disagreement, right? And uh, the same is true for, you know, economic discussions, national security discussions. And so it, it really taught me, again, just to, to go back to, you know, to elements of, of Booth and, and MBA, everything about the MBA is applicable to so many different sectors. Uh, marketing and brand and messaging uh, is equally important, in, if not more so, in, in, in some of these aspects. Uh, you know, so, so, so I learned a ton about... It's not just about getting the right answer, and, and you have to. You have to find the right answer and the right solutions for, for people and society. But if you don't complete that mission, if you don't put the right influence on it, the right messaging around it to get it done, then, then you're not going to be as successful. And I, and I look right now, we, we have much more a problem of, of politics and messaging than we do sort of you know, the answers are complex, but they're achievable, but we have to fix our politics first. And, and you look at it right now within the pandemic. Uh, the mm -hmm. science in many of these cases is overwhelming um, around the power of vaccinations, around elements of social distancing or you know mask wearing. Mm -hmm. But those things have become political. They have become emblems of something that they are not. And um, I think that's dangerous. I also think the final thing that, that I've seen that's really, really dangerous is, um, you know, the war on truth, the war on data, the war on facts. So many of the things that I, I learned at Booth, that I learned at the University of Chicago, the importance of data, the importance of evidence, the importance of, uh, of data-driven hypotheses and, and evidence-based answers, uh, for the greatest country on earth, if we don't fix the war on science and, and data and facts and truth, um, then almost all the other wars I think will be lost downstream. So, so, so that is something that keeps me up at night and something that I, I look to work, work on all the time. So without going into specific names, I mean, in general, doctors have been very thrust into the forefront of being involved in policy of over the last several months. Do you have a general take on that and how that's played out? Is that a role doctors feel comfortable with? Should they be involved in that? What is your view on that? Yeah, I, I have a lot, a lot of views on that. I, I, again, kind of bridging what I said before, expertise matters, training matters. And, and society has evolved. Civilization has gotten here uh, precisely because we have built expertise and specialization. You, you know, I have a... Uh, I think, you know, as I said before, the best education and business from, from Booth, it doesn't mean that if there's a area of corporate finance or accounting or cutting edge strategy um, that, that I'm not going to look to somebody to, to help inform my opinion on expertise matters. It's gotten us, you know, to where we are. And, and at the same time, you know, I, as I said before, because of a, um, a passion and a proclivity towards the intersection of, of medicine and policy, I had the opportunity to, 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 to be a policymaker, to, you know, at the highest level of the federal government do that, but, but it came with training. I, I think one of the issues that we have right now is this. We have policymakers with no medical experience masquerading as, as doctors and scientists, which I think is dangerous. 
I, I think it's also dangerous to have doctors thrust into a situation of being policymakers unless they specifically have that expertise, meaning there are some doctors uh, who have policy backgrounds and there are some policymakers, a handful who maybe are doctors by background. But right now, the idea that you have policymakers uh, opining on, you know, micro droplet microbiology and and you know epidemiology and, and things like that is is is, is poor. And at the same time, most doctors are not looking to be placed in the policy solutions. I would argue that just like a military general or in some cases, even uh, you know, economic advisors, leaders are elected and trained, hopefully, to make the decisions with the core set of advisors. So a military general may tell a, a, a principal, these are, these are the risks and the benefits, these are the pros and cons, here's the terrain, you know, here's what we're advising you. I think that is the right thing for doctors and scientists to do and have a decision maker make that. But right now we have, I, sadly, I see just to be blunt about it, the opposite. And uh, I think, I think we have to, we have to go back to scientists being trusted as scientists, doctors being trusted as doctors and policymakers listening to scientists and doctors and other expert, experts to then make informed decisions. Thank you. Thanks for the candor, Pat. Uh, let me switch topics a bit. You were the former president, chief medical officer of Doctor on Demand, right? So you helped start it. You grew the largest provider of video medical visits in the United States. Uh, so a couple of different things. Let me first start with why did you do that? Was, was entrepreneurship something you always wanted to do? Was that something you focused on at Booth or did this just was this just an idea that came to you uh, at some point? It, yeah, I, I think all, all of the above. Um, you know, let, let me kind of say this. I, I think I've always had somewhat of a of an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, you know, given I think I was placed in environments. You know, in, in the medical discipline, and then maybe some of the initial business environments that I was in, larger organizations, perhaps where where that wasn't sort of the natural, um, you know, place to sort of be an entrepreneur per se, at least in the way that, that we might think about it. But I, I think many of the things I love about entrepreneurship, the the innovation, the self-starterness, the, the really creation of, of something new and unique is is something, uh, you know, that, that has been in my DNA. But let me also be equally clear. I was very, very afraid initially. And as to the second part, Booth prepared me very well in so many ways. Some of the best experiences were some of the experiential learning classes. I mean, I can still remember. I, I love the the traditional lecture classes, uh, you know, a, a great deal. But with this conversation, things like the New Venture Challenge or, uh, you know, um, you know, Professor Meadows, uh, you know, private equity course or, or things that were clinical or hands on in nature where it forces you to use all of those muscles, uh, I think prepared me well. What it did not prepare me for perfectly, because I don't think you ever can, is that chasm that you initially step across uh, as an entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, the, the president and chief, office, or chief operating officer of a, of a large uh, merger of two public companies, uh, you know, uh, Virtual Radiologic and Nighthawk at the time. And yeah, no way for me to, uh, to sugarcoat this. I, I remember just saying, Pat, what on earth are you thinking? You, you are going to leave this to go, you know, uh, start a company, you know, from, from scratch. And many people in the Booth Network were some of the dozens of people that I called who reflected back a, a certain belief and confidence and, and not necessarily confidence that you're automatically really successful, but the confidence that you should do this, that you should try this, and even if you quote unquote fail, that you learn as much from that as as otherwise, you know. And and to this day, one of my favorite quotes is, "Our greatest glory comes not from never falling, but rather from rising every time you fall." And so, it, there took there took a lot of that to to kind of get me going. And um, without a doubt, I make the analogy: as a doctor, you learn the most when you're on call when you're the person making those decisions. I think in, in business, 
you learn the most when you're the buck stops with you as an operator and as an entrepreneur in particular, there's, there's no one behind you. You know, I, I still remember joking with some of my, my network. Uh, they said, okay, Pat, this is a great concept. Doctor on demand, you know, video visit. Can we send something over to your legal department? And I would say, yeah, why don't you send that to pbasu at doctorondemand.com? Can we send this to your marketing team? Yeah, why don't you send that to pbasu at doctorondemand.com? You know, all of a sudden you don't have the, the thousands of people sort of supporting you, at least initially. And, I, and I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's harrowing, it's exhilarating, um, but you spend a lot of sleepless nights kind of staring at the ceiling saying, geez, am I gonna make this work? But it makes you not only a better entrepreneur, it makes you a better executive because you are forced to really focus, really determine what matters versus what doesn't, and uh, and, and just uh, an incredible experience. And, and thankfully, you know, the company, as we like to say, it took a while for telehealth to, to ramp up, but as, as 2020 has proven, uh, you know, we, we, we were right initially and we're, we're very right now. There's, you know, there's going to be tens of millions of, uh, of visits this year. So I uh, can't say it was easy, but it's, it's really fulfilling to see, uh, you know, that, you know, where, where we've gotten. So let me take the second part, which you just touched on, Pat, which is that certainly this year has shown that telemedicine, it can work. A, also, let me ask you, has this year proven that telemedicine can work? Do you see just continued growth ahead or will this slow after the pandemic sort of goes away? You know, it's a great question. I, I think at least what I'm about to say is germane to medicine. I would argue it might even be argued uh, applicable to other sectors, but technological advancement in so many of our sectors is so far ahead of adoption said another way we can do some incredible things technologically but they're not in our hands or they're not in use to the extent that one would imagine i think in healthcare there's at least three reasons that prevent that in no particular order there are regulatory barriers um there are um there are special interest barriers or economic barrier competitive barriers in other words your disruption is going to take market share from somebody else and they're going to try and stop you. Um, and the third, and, and perhaps this one is most important, is just you know behavioral change, right? If you were to tell most Americans right now in the year 2020, well, in the year 2020, they probably wouldn't be flying as much, but in the year 2019, your, most of your airline flight is being flown on autopilot. They might be a little worried by that, but that is the reality. Similarly, in 2012, you know, when we were saying you can do a lot of this visit via video, a lot of people said, wait, that's a behavior change. That's that's something that is unorthodox for me and it takes time to get there. Now, after 2020, where tens of millions of people are doing it, they're saying, geez, I can't believe we didn't do this before. <laughs> Similar to, you know, withdrawing thousands of dollars on an ATM or, or wiring tens of thousands of dollars in a bank account. So it's kind of funny how that works. Um, Mada, specifically what I think is going to happen with telehealth is you're going to see this. Uh, you know, when we started Doctor on Demand, it was almost by definition of a zero. I, I think on the evolution of telehealth adoption, we got that to a three. Now it's it's gone all the way to a 10. I think you're actually going to see a little bit of a push back to maybe an eight or nine primarily because I think some of the regulations are going to um, sort of come back a little bit of a notch. The regulations went from highly restrictive to sort of wild, wild west. And people are going to understand the use cases where it's germane and those where it's not. I'll give you an example. In Doctor on Demand, it makes perfect sense for an urgent care visit. Um, but until you know this iPhone can deliver surgery and radiation therapy, you know, we've had to explain to some patients, yes, you know, we still need to take out your, your tumor in person before before that happens. And so, you know, so, so I think it, it will have it will open the floodgates in a good way. But I think, like most industries, it'll it'll find the right balance in the use cases that are that are relevant, and carve out the ones that that need further improvement. Okay, Pat. Let me. I'm going to turn it to Jessica now for some audience questions, and then I'll I'll come back uh, to you at the end, uh, Jessica. Yeah, Pat. There's quite a few here, so I'm just going to press through. And sorry, they don't seem feel real organized. But um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how? 
CTCA's philosophy on cancer treatment differs from other cancer specialty centers? That was the first question that came up a couple of times. Yeah, sure. Happy to do so. So, um, you know, as, as Mato mentioned, I, I've had the privilege of, uh, you know, working at uh, incredible institutions, uh, Stanford University Medical Center, uh, obviously, you know, the University of Chicago and and probably half a dozen other, uh, you know, top medical centers where I've, I've served at least as visiting faculty. Um, uh, CTCA's cancer philosophy, I, I think, is, is different in a few ways. Happy to opine if there's questions or later we can come back to the American healthcare system, but the American healthcare system ails for many, many reasons, one of which it does not put the patient at the center. Every one of you can relate to this experience. Every one of you, it doesn't matter whether you're a CEO or what your job is, you've shown up for a medical appointment and it's been the opposite of a service industry. Uh, they were late. Uh, they didn't know why you were there. If they knew your name, you filled out the same eight forms over and over. There was a, probably a 80% chance there was an error somewhere along the way. And you generally left feeling um, like you were a number. And if you were a doctor, on the other hand, or an executive, you would have felt that the system revolved around you. Dr. Basu, when would you like to show up, <laughs> you know, on your call, you know, for your call schedule? Uh, Dr. Basu, you know, is this a convenient place for you? Questions that they're asking me that a patient really do rarely doesn't get, answered, uh, get asked. One of the things I loved about CTCA, and I had nothing to do with creating it, is there's a philosophy, it is only and always about the patient here at CTCA. And so it's an incredible difference in paradigm when you walk through some incredible other top centers where you feel like a number versus where you feel like you are the center of that. As an extension of that, it is a comprehensive integrated cancer center, meaning it doesn't just have the cutting edge gamma knife or surgery or precision medicine therapy that an incredible place like a Stanford might have, but it also has a behavioral health specialist and a, uh, and a coach and a, uh, somebody explicitly dedicated to your side effects. Um, and, and so that really changes the care. Uh, to, to give you a concrete example, um, the average time between diagnosis and treatment in American oncology is 28 days. For us, it's less than five days. And the average time to treatment is, you know, pushing 40 plus days. Our time to treatment is usually done within 10 days. Comprehensive team, all of the doctors, all the nurses there at the same time together. And it leads to, to better outcomes. It leads to better satisfaction. And, uh, and again, just to be clear, I, I, I actually um, can't take any credit for that. <laughs> that was here before. I can only screw it up. And so those are some of the things that, that separate us um, as a complex cancer care center. And, and one of my jobs is to steward and make sure that we remain a, you know, a top 1% in, in both outcomes and, and patient satisfaction. You started to mention this um, when you when you were responding to that last question, but in your opinion, you know, what are the most pressing pressing issues that are facing the U.S. healthcare system right now? Um, geez, how long do we have for this? No, I'm just kidding. I'll, 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 uh, I, I'm happy to come back and do maybe a you know a longer uh, you know symposium on this. But let, let me let me start with a few things. If you look at the, the triple aim of, you know, cost and quality and access. Uh, almost maybe I'll call access service so I can get a, a broader uh, topic around it. If you look at cost, we spend, as I mentioned before, roughly 19% of GDP. One dollar out of every out of every American dollar going towards healthcare. Roughly on average, that is twice as much as the most expensive country. And it's about $4,000 more for every man, woman, and child than every other OECD nation, meaning every other sort of modernized nation. So without making a philosophical comment around that yet, one might say, well, okay, that's just a number. What's the denominator? The denominator is what do we get for that? In terms of quality, the numbers are staggering. Roughly 100,000 Americans die every year due to medical error. In fact, medical error has become the third leading cause of death in, in the medical system, which is shocking. 
out of 32 million discharges in the United States, 8 million of them had a major medical error being caused by the system. And sometimes the incentives are, are perverse. Uh, there was a journal of the American Medical Association study uh, not long ago that showed that hospitals made 330% the profit when an error occurred. To be clear, you know, I think in the vast, vast, vast majority of those cases, it was not an intentional thing, but the incentives were misaligned. So those dollars deliver poor quality and they deliver poor service. Average wait time to get a primary care appointment is north of three weeks. To get a specialty appointment is seven weeks. And as I mentioned before, anybody who's interacted with the healthcare system, you know, oftentimes don't know your name. You keep filling out the same forms. They're losing your records. It's, it's, it's the epitome of, of the, it's the opposite of a service. So, you know, those are some of the, the punchlines around what we need to fix. And, and we're living in a healthcare policy arena where I sometimes refer to as individual salvation, collective demise. Every, it's not just one piece. It's not just the payer piece. It's not just the provider piece. It's not just the, you know, and by the way, as somebody who's worked for <laughs> the largest payer, who's worked for large providers and is, is one, uh, works a lot with pharma, it's all of these collectively, but we focus on our piece of the pie. And, um, and, and so I, I believe it is not just literally killing us with the 100,000 deaths, but it is figuratively killing us. You know, I, I personally believe, and in my time at the White House, I espoused that the American healthcare system as it stands is one of the, the larger threats to American competitiveness and national security as some of the other things that we talk about, because if you look at the, the USA Jobs Council and things like that, employers and taxpayers and every citizen is being burdened with incredibly low value, spending too much, not getting enough. It's the opposite of everything that we learned at, at Booth to, you know, to, to make the system better. So again, happy to go into more detail at a, at a different time, but I'll, I'll just leave it there. And, and to make a, a plea, you don't have to be a healthcare veteran to go into healthcare. Quite the order, quite the contrary. We need more of you out there, alums and students. We need your interdisciplinary background. We need you to not come from healthcare and come join us in healthcare because this is a this could be one of the most important things the United States of America you know solves or has to solve to remain a great nation in the years ahead. So lots of work to be done, and uh, we need all the help we can get from very very bright uh, boot students and alums. Kind of following up on that, um, you talked about the help we need. There's several questions asking about, um, you know, what your expectations are, or how do you expect the Biden administration policies to kind of change how healthcare is delivered and help with some of those problems? Sure. You know, I uh, one thing I should say about the White House Fellowship is that it is one of the senior most nonpartisan uh, appointments that are out there. And I think along with, you know, um, some of the, the military positions, that's a, a really good place to be. To, to go back to Madhav's question just for a moment, our system in politics is hurting us tremendously. Um, we are all quantitative people united by uh, what, what Booth and the University of Chicago taught us. It's not just a qualitative uh, polarization of American society and politics, it's quantitative as well. If you map out how Democratic senators and congressmen and Republican senators and congressmen voted, it used to look like this. Over time, it looks like this, meaning that the likelihood that they vote just down straight party lines now is much, much higher. And the center has been uh, excavated out and the extremes are flourishing for systemic reasons, which, again, we can talk about. Um, so with that as, as a background, I just have to say, you know, we need to find common ground again. Um, the words, you know, there's so many false choices going on in society right now. You have to look at the, the choices we as Americans have been given between the pandemic or social and criminal justice or other things. You've basically been given one extreme versus another, right? And politics has taught messengers to deliver those messages, but we have to be better about that. With that as a prelude, you know, to the Biden administration as it relates to healthcare, you know, I, I have a lot of friends, um, you know, that, that I know are going to serve in the Biden administration. I have a lot of respect for uh, President-elect Biden and 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 many of the leaders that um, 
you know, I know he's going to be bringing in. I've, I've been in dialogue with some of them. And Jeff Zions, uh, who he just named, is, is one of the most competent, you know, professionals. Uh, Secretary Becerra, uh, the, the Attorney General of California, um, who will serve as HHS Secretary. Very, very talented, um, experienced uh, operator. And so, you know, I think they're going to make, uh, obviously, you know, you have to, to make the pandemic a priority. It needs to be a national priority. I think sometimes that can take you off of your other healthcare reform agendas. So I don't know what impact that is going to have because you end up only having a certain amount of political capital, not to mention a certain amount of economic capital. So I, I don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but I do know that on the campaign trail, there were um, discussions more from the Biden administration around uh, the ability for Americans to choose um, and buy into more public options, um, uh, you know, uh, if, if they had that choice. But, but again, we'll see how things play out both in terms of their prioritization as, a, as, in, as well as in terms of what they're able to get passed. Pat, there are a lot of questions um, asking about your opinion on value-based care. You know, is it a fad? Um, you know, primarily payers um, benefit and providers lose. You know, thoughts on that? People are asking you to comment on that one. <clears throat> yeah, happy to do so. So, uh, first and foremost, the, the the joke, but the reality is value-based care, but value to whom? Right. And, and again, if I come back to CTCA, if I come back to an ethos of the American healthcare system, the value has to be to the patient. Healthcare is one of the most distorted sectors, by the way, um, a lot of administrative waste. I'll give you a quick statistic. The estimate from a, a study showed roughly nine hundred billion dollars of administrative waste in the healthcare system. To put that in context, at the time of the study, the entire budget of the Department of Defense was seven hundred billion dollars. Right. So you make fun of the you know the eighty dollar hammer, supposedly that the DoD is procuring. Healthcare was estimated to waste more than the entire DoD's entire budget. Um, it's the only sector that has had a decrease in uh, you know per unit productivity over the last 20 years. Uh, spend and crowding out is, is, is incredible. And so value-based care is the following concept. Instead of just incenting more procedures, um, how do you incent quality? When taken at that level, it's a wonderful paradigm. Absolutely, you know, patients should pay less or, or providers should make more if the patient gets higher quality and better service. It's, it's the American way. It's any service industry w would have that theme. How this gets legislated, how this gets executed, and how it gets politicized, of course, is different. Let me give you an example. I ran one of the largest value-based care businesses in, in the country uh, for United in, in Optum Care. In that business, you know, we were able to reward patients for uh, providers for higher quality and better service as measured by patient satisfaction, higher quality as measured by outcomes. And from a cost perspective, perspective, something called the total cost of care, meaning the annual spend. What sometimes happens is the marginal cost of care is what gets focused on. So just take the following example. You could have a doctor that charges $100 and a doctor that charges $110. If you're penny wise and pound foolish, you might just say, well, let's contract with the, do the doctor that charges $100. But if that doctor leads to care that costs, costs $10,000 and the other one leads to care that costs $8,000, it's a different scenario. Of course, that says nothing about the intrinsic quality and, and the service along those lines. The bottom line is we have to take courageous decisions. The United States of America is on an unsustainable course in terms of its value ratio. We're spending too much for what we're getting, so things need to be done. The, the direction, the, the mission or vision of value-based care makes sense. The operations and the execution of it is, and, and frankly, just even the definition of it is what, what we need to continue to work on. But by and large, um, shifting a system where quality and service matter as much, if not more so, as the number of procedures 
is something that uh, that we have to get right because economic incentives matter a great deal. And, uh, you know, behavioral economics, I think, you know, University of Chicago is, is one of the, the forefronts in that, which, by the way, if I may, can I just insert a, one of my favorite jokes? I, I have to say this really quick. I know we're on recording. My brother went to Kellogg, love, you know, Kellogg friends, and, and but, but there's a great joke I had to, I had to toss out there. Apparently, there's a, uh, there's a square with a bell on the Kellogg campus, and supposedly they got rid of the, uh, the bell because they wanted to say that they also had no bells. <laughs> Sorry, I had, I had to smile. <laughs> Anyways, I say it with love. I have many friends that are that are faculty there and, and alums, and my brother. So I had to get that out there. But in on a serious note, uh, you know, we uh, we really need the economic incentives, the behavioral economics, to be right, not just for the larger system, but for providers. And so that's what I think the ultimate value based care will get to. So, a couple of questions more about practice. Um, what advances are you seeing in non-invasive diagnostic tools for specific cancers, including, you know, um, prostate cancer? I'll give you some great, great news about cancer. Is um, uh, this is such one of the things that led me to this job? Is I think the de the decade or the era maybe of cardiovascular disease was probably in the early 2000s a proliferation of of cures and therapies and earlier di you know diagnosis and stopping heart attacks before they come meaning prevention taking care of heart attacks and heart disease after uh, you know a, a patient has a, a an event such as a heart attack I think this is going to be such a decade for for cancer. I think prevention, 50% of cancers are preventable, uh, according to the literature. Uh, huge amounts of work that we can do there. Because of advances we've made in cancer, there are now 18 million Americans surviving with the diagnosis of cancer. We need to take better care of them as we attempt to turn cancer from a fatal disease to a chronic disease. And then specifically, um, you know, in the elements of non-invasive diagnosis, a few areas. First of all, just therapy wise, precision medicine uh, is a game changer. The ability to really understand the genomic composition of your body, as well as the genomic, um, the genomic, let, let me use this word, the genomic composition of the tumor and understanding how that affects therapy is remarkable. Let me, let me give you an example. When I was first in medical school, I, I sometimes say that there were, there were maybe 10 or 12 types of cancer named by the organ type, breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, of course, we still refer to those. Now there's, there's 10,000 types of cancers because now at cutting edge places, we're not just looking at the organ type, we're looking at the, the cell and the mutation. And if we can treat that mutation, it is much more efficacious and much more um, safe to the rest of the body. So immunotherapy is a category um, and, and precision medicine, uh, you know, generally that is going to be a game changer. Similarly, on the diagnostic side, um, with liquid biopsy, with looking for blood markers in your body, um, with molecular imaging, where you might be able to detect cancer when it's just dozens of cells instead of, you know, millions of cells as a, as a tumor, is going to allow us to catch cancer earlier. And catching cancer earlier is one of the great bedrocks of cancer care therapy. If you look at breast cancer, if you catch it in stage one, by and large, you're talking about a now 99% uh, you know, likelihood of survival versus the number dropping to you know 25% in stage four. Um, if you look at every other cancer, there's a similar curve. So early diagnosis is absolutely critical. And yes, non-invasive uh, testing or minimally invasive testing uh, and diagnosis is, is a key, key um, uh, pathway to that. Um, a couple of questions about um, get together your thoughts on where do you see companies like Amazon and Walmart in the future of healthcare industry, um, particularly since they're starting to invest outside of just pharma you know, services? I, I think a tremendous role to play. I, I think competition is 
is a good thing for markets. It's a great thing for consumers. By the way, going back to the political comment, uh, you don't have a lot of competition in American politics. Maybe not. Maybe not a, a, a you know a bad hypothesis as to why we're getting uh, you know as consumers uh, some some issues there. Um, and so healthcare used to be very very siloed. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it was just you were the only <laughs> the only doctor, the only doctor type in there. You're the only hospital in there. Um, now you're talking about payers in value-based care. You're talking about payers becoming providers, providers becoming payers, the word pay provider. I think the role of Amazon and CVS and, and Walgreens and a bunch of other companies we haven't even heard of yet uh, is going to be uh, tremendous, or, or rather that maybe we haven't even thought of as healthcare companies yet. Again, the bad news about 20% uh, of GDP is it's an unsustainable um, trajectory. The good news is I think it attracts a lot of um, entrepreneurs and disruptors. It attracts a lot of um, other wonderful companies, uh, you know, that can that can make a big difference here. The digit the digitization of healthcare, um, the impact of technology is going to be remarkable, and I think companies like Amazon are going to have a lot to say about that. Uh, I, I think so many companies that are non-traditional healthcare companies are going to help us get to where we need to to do. And so it's going to introduce competition. It's going to drive uh, better solutions. Fundamentally, it's actually going to drive great partnerships. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, we're talking to, to companies in these areas uh, specifically because you know your best solutions come from partnering with the best in, in in a given ecosystem as opposed to always trying to do it yourself and so i think the impact in the decade ahead is going to be indescribable dean rajan i'll turn it back over to you okay. um thank you jessica so pat maybe a, a few quick questions as we're coming to the end of time first do you still get to practice being a doctor I do. I do. It's not as uh, I'm one of those people, in case you can't tell, that likes the multiple uses of the brain and, and likes the variety. I think my my utility, to use that economic term, my happiness stems more from doing a, a lot of different things than, than, than just being siloed. Um, so, yes, I, uh, you know, most recently, uh, not only at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, but I, I intentionally uh, at the VA get to take care of veterans. And so I don't get to do it as often, but I enjoy it. And, um, and I only do things uh, still where I, where I know my skill set is, uh, you know, is, is utmost. And, uh, you know, I don't do some of the things that, that I think, uh, you know, are not at the highest level of quality. I, I wouldn't touch those anymore. Okay. And uh, do you find time for your own health and wellness? Do you have any tips for the audience about those things? Yeah, the biggest tip is you have to make that a priority. There is not only no shame in making it a priority. I, I think maybe a couple decades ago there was this. Certainly in in medicine, it was oh, I you know I, I want to be on call every night or in the executive ranks. You bragged about how much you know lack of sleep you got. Uh, in both of those disciplines, we have absolutely found evidence that that is not good. It's not good for you. It's not good for morale. And it's not good for the sustainable outcomes that you're trying to drive. So just like one of the things I love about CTCA is not just we treat the mind, we, we not only treat the body, but also you know the, the mind, it's the same thing. You have to have physical wellness, you have to have emotional wellness, you have to have social wellness. I think you have to have some form of whatever person's spiritual wellness is, not to say religious, but just you know whatever spiritual may mean. And so, so me, um, for me, I, I, I really uh, try to constantly, you're never going to be perfect, but strike that balance, uh, you know, trying to you know, train for the occasional triathlon, uh, really investing in, in family and friends. This year in particular, where I know people have said COVID has made it seem that they don't um, get to work from home, but they actually live at work. Uh, you know, a lot of social stressor, stressors on people you have to take care of yourself. And, um, and I think as type A, very successful by definition, you know, boot students and alums, easiest thing to forget is your, is your own health. So, so if you want to have a sustainable impact, um, not to mention be good, be a good leader for your team and a good person for your family and friends, you have to have to make that a priority. 
Okay, one last question. Your thoughts on the vaccines and when do you think we'll be in something like what used to be normal? Well, that's a short, easy question. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll go on record again on the vaccines as saying this. Um, you know, the greatest country on earth, uh, if we don't get back to, you know, science and truth and data and facts rising above darkness and rumors and lies, then every other war that we fight, we will lose. So the reality is, um, you know, science and vaccines matter. Um, I think it's remarkable uh, to see that there's, you know, 90, 95 percent efficacy on some of these vaccines. Uh, my latest uh, information from the scientific community and the political community is that, um, you know, hopefully 100 million. Uh, and by the way, you want to talk about needing business people in medicine. You want to talk about supply chain operations. This is why we need the best minds from the sector in this. Um, is, uh, you know, that, that there is hopefully the ability to get a first round of 100 million vaccines, you know, out there in, uh, you, you know, by the by this spring. Um, COVID has taught many of us the hard way not to try and set hard deadlines. <laughs> um, but so, so I will say this, I think we need to get as many vaccines safely out as possible, uh, make it as accessible and available to as many Americans as quickly as possible. And I, I do genuinely believe that uh, we will have those available, um, you know, this spring in, in mass. As far as defining what normalcy means, um, you know, I think the world once changed may, may, may not return fully to what it was. This is going to be a, a macro event. This is going to be a sentinel event that we will refer to as pre-COVID and post-COVID, arguably greater than the re Great Recession and maybe greater than 9-11 in terms of reforming the world, uh, the economy, the way business gets done. So I don't really think that there will be a entirely a return to 2019 as we know it in many ways. Now, in terms of the individual normalcy of getting together and, and some of those things, my my hope as a, as a physician and executive is that by the, you know, the, the latter part of, uh, of 2021 is, is when I'm hoping that that some of that returns. But, you know, I don't want to be I don't want to be a fool, you know, betting against uh, the multiple variables that are at play here. But uh, you know, I, I certainly am an optimistic person. I think brighter days are on the horizon. And I do think that, uh, you know, we're, we're rounding the, the corner and irrespective, we'll be more prepared uh, for the future than we were in, in 2020. Uh, Pat, I wanted to thank you. Uh, this has been incredibly informative, uh, interesting and valuable uh, to, to me, certainly to our community. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time and uh, congratulations on the amazing things that you have achieved with your uh, career. It really was a pleasure to spend more time with you, and I appreciate you giving your wisdom to our community. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. I'd be remiss if I didn't make it clear. I am, uh, you know, Booth uh, you know, has had such an impact on my life. I'm hoping I, you know, some of my friends are in the audience. I made so many friends during my time there and uh, my classmates. But thank you for your leadership. Thank you for uh, everyone who, who took time. This is an incredible institution that is world changing that is global changing i'm a proud to be a part of the community and uh, thanks for having me on thank you my pleasure Pat. thank you everyone take care see you